Hiya masters and welcome. Now I have 10 less not me stories to share with you guys and well let's get on to the storytelling. So without further ado, let the stories begin. My Mom's Friend by Zero Ad General. This story takes place throughout the entire year of 2010, which was my senior year of high school. This is a story also told in the perspective of a male. Anyways, let's get on to the story. When my mom got out of her financial struggles and found a steady job, one of her longtime friends, Justin, asked for her help as he had just gotten laid off and lived in a sketchy part of town. My mother was friendly and didn't mind company since she had been single ever since I was born. Justin would live with my mom and I from January to the end of June, and for the most part he was cool and shared the same interest as me. But when summer rolled around he seemed tense and nervous most of the time, which was odd since he was the laid back and carefree kind of guy. When my mom realized he no longer needed our help and basically freeloaded off of us, they got into a heated argument and my mom kicked them out. No incidents occurred after and the school year ended. In July, my mom went to visit family in Mississippi and entrusted me with the house. Unlike any other teenager with an opportunity like this, I invited all my close friends over to, you know, bullshit around. We all passed out around 2 a.m. and everything was fine. It could not have been over 10 minutes when I was jolted awake by a loud knock at the front door. My stomach sunk as I thought my mom had come home early and noticed all the cars parked outside the house. But when I peered out the upstairs window overlooking the driveway to see who had pulled in, my mom's car wasn't there. It was Justin's. In my confused state, I decided to wait it out and see if he'd leave. The knocking stopped, and after what felt like years, I heard the front door open. I start to frantically wake up my friends and tell them that Justin just walked into the house. Now keep in mind, these guys know who I'm talking about since they've seen him before. The four of us were still tired and pretty much in a daze as we walked out of the living room and peered down the staircase that overlooked the entryway. We saw the outline of Justin's body just standing there. At this point we freaked out and I have no idea how he got in or why he was here when suddenly Justin starts running towards us and sprinting up the staircase. Justin is able to quickly get up the staircase and all we can do is stumble over each other in the darkness trying to get back to the living room. Now, Justin was able to get up the stairs and turn on the hallway light before we could hide and as soon as he turns on the light and sees us drunken and scared shitless, he smiles and says, Sorry, I thought you were your mom. Then, he turns the light back off and calmly walks down the stairs and leaves. When my mom got back from her short trip, I told my friends not to mention the incident to her in the future unless something else happens with Justin. No further incidents occurred, and I moved out for college. Neither me or my mom have even seen Justin since then. I assume he moved on and left us be. But even now, this has always been in the back of my mind. Let me out of the car. Bye, you clever girl. On a dark, cold night in the late 70s, my dad's truck broke down about an hour from home. He started walking and put his thumb out for hitching a ride and was soon picked up by a middle-aged man in a brown sedan. My dad gets into the car. Thanks, man. I appreciate the lift. The driver doesn't respond. I'm trying to get further north. Where are you heading? The driver again doesn't respond and begins to drive. Without even a look, 
The driver locks the doors and puts his hand on my dad's upper thigh and squeezes. My dad was 24 and 25 years old. He worked in construction, specifically drywall. He wasn't a tall man, but was barrel chested, stocky. My dad turns and faces him. Look man, I'm not into that. I just need a ride. The driver doesn't move his hand. After 10 seconds of silence, Look, man, let me out of the car. The driver doesn't respond. Doesn't even look at him. My dad grabs the man's hand and peels it off his thigh. Look, dude, let me out of the car, motherfucker. I will kick your fucking ass. Let me out now. My dad was ready to strike. Without a word, again, without even looking at him, the driver pulls over, unlocks the door. My dad jumps out. The driver peels off. And my dad eventually arrives home and tells everyone what happened. And the family doesn't believe him. Now a few years later, he's dating my mom. They're watching the news which is covering the arrest of a serial killer, John Wayne Gacy. My mom said my dad went pale. My dad jumped out of his chair, shaking violently, and started screaming and pointing at the TV. That, that's him! That's the guy who picked me up! My mom says she believed him immediately. My dad wasn't much of a liar or a prankster. He was pretty blunt about things. He was a rather quiet man and didn't crave attention. I was so intrigued by this incident that in the late 90s I read a few books on Gacy, including one written based on his interviews. And Gacy picked up countless hitchhikers over a multi-year period in the 70s. Sometimes he would pick up hitchhikers and take them wherever they wanted to go, without incident. Now the timeline, details, geography, MO were all consistent. My theory is that Gacy picked my dad up thinking he was younger than he was and then tested out my dad's reaction. My dad was a bit older than Gacy's target age of uh, 18, 20. When my dad fought back aggressively, and immediately, Gacy figured he wasn't worth the trouble, and possibly also realized that my dad was not as young as he looked. Now a few years ago, my husband and I were at an event, and we started chit-chatting with a couple seated at our table. For some unremembered reason, I told this story. The female half of the couple turned white and stared at me, mouth wide open. She said that her uncle has had an almost identical Gacy encounter. I'm just so sad for those who were unable to escape. My grand was being stalked by a crazy woman with no life. By Garen. As the title suggests, this is not something that happened to myself, but to my grandmother, who I call Gran. This also happened recently, last week. I will update you all if anything else comes from this. My Gran decided to take a trip to Burke's outlet, so she does. She heads into the store, and only a few seconds later she is being called out by a woman, shouting, Hey you! She turns to the woman in question who apparently ran after her and into the outlet. This woman is probably between the ages of 40, 45, and my gran is 65. As soon as this woman approaches my gran, she was instantly in her face and shouting at her. My gran is confused at first, but soon pieces together this woman's disjointed yelling. Apparently, this woman had been following my gran for three weeks. Well, we don't know if she knows where my gran lives or any personal details about her, but every time she catch my gran's distinctive bright emerald Oldsmobile driving about, she would follow her around. Why was she following my gran? Well, apparently she thought my gran had cut her off three weeks ago prior, and she had been following her to find an opportunity to scream at her about it. She kept mentioning the name of a town that's about 40 or so minutes away from us. We're not sure if she meant that's where it took place or where she thought my gran lived. This stuck my gran as odd because during that time, she had been in the hospital for some minor surgery. 
and my mother had the car. My mother had no reason to go into uh, this town and hadn't been there. Anyways, my grand told her that she didn't believe it to be true for these reasons, but apologized if she accidentally cut her off. The woman continues to yell at my gran, telling her it had to be her because of the car. Now, Oldsmobiles are uncommon nowadays, but it's not impossible to find them anymore. Now, at this point, the woman was starting to gather attention from nearby shoppers and clerks due to her scene. My gran, the badass, told her simply this was the only apology she was to be getting and that she better be on her way. If she came into Burke's to shop, then she suggested she do so and leave her the hell alone. The woman persisted, to what reason we're still unsure, and tried to block off my grand when she tried to walk away. My grand warned her to get out of her face and asked the woman if she knew what the term stalking meant. She told the woman in no certain terms that she honestly felt sorry for her. If this hurt her so badly that she felt the need to stalk her for three weeks, she must really have no life. Two more times my gran had warned her to get out of her face, and my gran was getting very close to getting into a fist fight with this woman. She started to look around, and my gran felt that the woman realized she was about to ask someone to call the police. That's when the woman finally left her and walked deeper into the store. A few moments later, she hurried out with apparently no intention to shop. My gran sort of laughed an embarrassed laugh and told the woman at the front desk that she was going to just chill out around here for a bit because she didn't want to go outside and risk further confrontation. When she finally left, the woman was gone and there seemed to be no sign of her doing anything to her car. That was good. And she strolled around for a bit to see if anyone was following her before finally driving home. Crazy ass bitch who felt the need to stalk a 65 year old woman for three weeks under the assumption that she cut you off. I hope my grand does not meet you again. You might not like the outcome. Almost Abducted at Walmart by L&M Please This happened several years ago. One summer, on a random weekend, my family and I decided to go to Walmart to pick up a few things. When the whole family went as a group, we would usually split up. My younger brother stayed with my mom, and I stayed with my dad. So, Dad and I made our way back to the electronics section, and, as was typical for every 14-year-old girl, I went to look at the CDs as Dad browsed big screen TVs and computer monitors a couple of aisles over. I was enveloped in Hilary Duff's new CD, reading all the track titles, when I felt someone standing right behind me. Someone tall. I turned around, expecting to see my dad making a goofy face, but it was a stranger. A tall man in his late thirties. He had a creepy as hell grin on his face. Hi, he said, not breaking eye contact with me. Oh, hi, I replied. I played softball, so I thought it might be a softball dad. Now, as strange as that sounds, in my small town, I was sort of used to grown men approaching my dad and I and talking about softball or how their daughters went to the same school as I did. I started to feel a little relieved when I assumed it was a softball dad, so I smiled back and said, how are you? Fully expecting him to say, fully expecting him to say something like, I'm her dad, and she's in your English class, or something harmless like that. What's your name? He asked, still wearing that terrifying grin. Red flag. If he was a softball dad, wouldn't he know my name? Michelle. And I lied, thinking on my feet. How old are you? 
He asked as he started to move closer to me, backing me up into the end of the aisle. Uh, 16. Now I lied again. I didn't know what else to do, but I knew for sure I wasn't going to tell him the truth. You're very pretty. I cringed and became nauseous. Where do you go to school? Damn, was this 21 questions? Why did he need to know all this? He was no more than a foot away from me, slowly closing in, and I had nowhere to go. I was getting ready to lie for a third time when, out of the corner of my eye, I saw someone approach us. My dad. I had never seen him so angry. His eyes were bloodshot with rage, as if on command, and at six foot and 250 pounds, he's an intimidating guy. He didn't say a word to the man, but his stance made him look 10 feet tall. Immediately, the stranger threw his hands up and started slowly backing away, stuttering. I, 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 I'm, I'm sorry, man. I, I thought I knew her. Once he was far enough away from us, he all but sprinted away. Dad looked at me and pleaded, Stay with me, please. And more than happily obliged, and my hero and I reunited with my mom and brother. I was shaken up and pretty scared, and for a couple of years afterward, I didn't go to Walmart by myself. And to be honest, ten years later, I am still weary about going there by myself. I usually bring my boyfriend. But if this shit taught me anything, it's vigilance and alertness. When I'm walking anywhere alone, I am hyper aware of my surroundings. And if a stranger makes eye contact with me and starts walking in my direction, I know to be cautious. Under the Bridge by Piercyin. This story was told by my aunt. It takes place in the 70s, when my aunt was a teenager. She lived in what was probably the safest place in the entire world, a small town village in northern Norway. She had been to a party, probably about one mile from her home. No one she knew was driving in the direction of her home, so she had to walk. This was not a problem since it was a beautiful summer night and she had walked this distance countless times in her life never experiencing anything dangerous. The walk was mostly on gravel, passing a couple of houses and farms, but mostly just fields and woods. A beautiful scenic landscape with nights as bright as day. If you've been to northern Norway, you know what I mean. When she'd gotten about halfway home, she noticed a car driving behind her. It was a white van. She had never seen it before. This was strange since around here everyone knew each other. It was unusual for out-of-towners to be driving here, especially at this time of night. At this point, my aunt was almost at the bridge, and she had to cross to get home. This was a pretty big and long bridge going over a large lake. The van drove past her, very slowly. Inside were two men she had never seen before, staring at her. When the van had driven past her, it sped up. She got this horrible feeling like something terrible was about to happen. She knew the van had to drive over the bridge and then some more before they would be able to turn around. This gave her a couple of minutes to get away. She considered running into the woods, but she knew she had to get back here anyway to cross the bridge. She decided that hiding under the bridge would be best. From afar, it looked like there was no space between the bridge and the water. But she had been playing there as a kid, and she knew if she went under the bridge, there was a little space you could sit in without getting wet. As soon as she got under the bridge, she heard the van return. It stopped right over her, and the two men got out. I saw a girl. She was right here, man. Where is she now? One of the men said. Uh, she probably ran into the woods. We won't find her. The other man replied. They both got back in the van and drove off. My aunt sat under the bridge for about 30 minutes, scared the two men would come back. Then she heard another car approaching. 
This time, thank God, the sound was familiar and she recognized the car belonging to her neighbor. He drove her home. She told him she had had way too much to drink and had fallen asleep by the bridge, not mentioning the van or the men. For some reason, she didn't tell anyone this story until years later. Maybe she was afraid her strict father wouldn't let her go out anymore to parties and such. I live in a town not far from where this happened, and still I go back to my aunt's and mother's childhood home from time to time. Every time I go over this bridge, I get the chills. Meth Head Home Invasion by Cryptic Lizard. Just a little backstory. I am a 13 year old boy, not that big or muscular. And it's about 7 30 p.m., so it's getting dark out. Okay, so let's get to the story. One day I was at home alone playing Call of Duty when I heard a knock at the door. I went to answer it like a stupid idiot I was. Behind the glass door, I saw a large man at the door wearing a t-shirt, sweatpants, and a hat pulled down over his head so I couldn't see his face fully. He had a long brown beard and was a large man and he was very intimidating. He looked like he was on meth or some sort of drug. And then, with a cigarette hanging out of his mouth, I proceeded to ask if my parents were home. They were not. Of course, I lied, saying they were. He asked to speak with them. I closed the door and then I got a call from my neighbor. Apparently, he had seen me from his porch while he was smoking. My neighbor was a 230 pound former boxer and not somebody you want to fuck with. He said he noticed somebody outside my house and asked if I was okay. I said no and I told him that there was this guy. I wasn't for sure, but he looked like he was on meth. He said that he would talk to the guy. I was watching from my window as my neighbor walked over to the man. My neighbor proceeded to yell at the man. My neighbor told me that the man said he was from the gas company. He never specified which one. The man finally got into his beat up white unmarked van and sped off down the road out of sight. I have a feeling like my neighbor wasn't home on his porch. I might not be here typing this right now. The rapist or robber? I think it's best for the best if we don't meet again. <laughs> the Guys in the Bushes by Dieselator I used to go running at night on the track at the high school across the street from my house. One warm summer night around 12.30, I'm walking down one of the outside hallways in the school building to get to the track. I hear rustling in a bush about 10 feet ahead of me. A guy steps out into the walkway. He's in his 30s, skinny, with a non-ironic, non-hipster beard. He asked me in a matter-of-fact voice if I happened to have a spare tire. I said no. I see two other guys of the same age standing inside the large bush he came out of. They're fully dressed, and they're not drinking or smoking pot or doing anything else in there. They're just standing there. The guys are deep inside the school property, far from any road. They don't have tools or other things that guys who were trying to fix a flat tire would typically have. There were no backpacks or bags or anything else in there with them, not, not that I can see. All three of them seem genuinely friendly. They're not aggressive or threatening toward me in any way. They're absolutely not drunk or high or crazy. They look like decent guys. A little rough around the edges, maybe, but basically, they're okay. They might be roofers or construction workers or work for a tree service. The guy who asked me if I had a spare tire says politely, Okay, well, thanks anyway, 
and walks back into the bush. Now I did my run and I went back home the same way I came. The guys were gone. I never saw them again. And that's it. I was home alone most nights by Jimmy of Suburbia. So, I grew up in Las Vegas. I had moved there when I was in second grade. I was around seven or so. My mom was working at some sort of motorcycle repair shop in Arizona that just wasn't paying the bills at all. She jumped on the first offer of a new job, of course. Well, fast forward about five years. I'm in the middle of school now. My brother and I were almost exactly two years apart. I was about two turned 12, so he was 10 at the time. My mother, being quite low on the seniority list, was forced to work late nights. That left me and my brother home alone after school more often than not. Our nights were usually pretty uneventful, usually consisted of us avoiding whatever homework was assigned, warming up leftovers in the microwave and watching whatever sparked our interest on TV, which was usually either WWE wrestling or some kind of cartoon. We usually ended up in the bed before our mom got home, but occasionally we'd wait up for her. Well, one night, or I suppose one afternoon, considering it was still broad daylight, everything was pretty normal. My brother sat on the living room floor, engulfed in whatever was on TV, and I was using my mom's desktop computer, feeding my virtual pets. And then there was a rather aggressive knock at the door, which was very odd. I was sort of an outcast child, I didn't really have too many friends, nor did my brother. Even then, we, we lived in what you would consider a senior living community. My mother was the youngest adult there, she was around her mid-thirties. My brother, being too short to reach the peephole, doesn't move, well, well only slightly, just to look at me. I get up from the computer chair and make my way to the front door to glance out the peephole. I see a man in a black ski mask staring back at me through the peephole. It definitely didn't seem real, it sort of seemed like something from a cliche movie, as if he was dressed to rob a bank. I was immediately scared shitless and I obviously didn't bother asking who it was. I silently stepped away, shut off the TV grabbed my brother and our small black Pomeranian and ran towards my bedroom. Once we were safely hidden in my closet, I informed him of what I saw outside. I slid the tiny flip phone our mom left us for emergencies from my pocket and dialed 911. I whispered to the operator the entirety of the call, as I didn't think the man had left considering the knocks persisted after we left the living room. Yet somehow she understood me and sent an officer over. Immediately after the call ended with the operator, I dialed for our mother. I explained everything to her. She ended up leaving work early and ended up home around the same time the police had. I'm not quite sure what deterred him of pursuing further, but of course, the man was gone by the time they both arrived. The officer was clearly not taking any of it seriously, most likely thinking these two young boys were just paranoid from staying home alone. It was probably some young man playing a joke on a friend of his. That was his explanation. However, like I stated previously, we lived in a senior living community. Who could he possibly be playing a joke on? <laughs> his dear grandmother? He then gave my brother and I a stickers. As if that would console our nerves after seeing some masked madman pounding on our door. Fortunately, I never saw the stranger after that. After that experience, my house, however, had been broken into, as well as the car, three times. Thankfully, none of us were present when any of this took place, since my family and I moved out of state and installed a security system. Nevertheless, creepy ski mask man, let's not meet.
Crazy Coyotes by Ross Dacoon. That was first post on Reddit, so excuse me for any mistakes and the like. I've been lurking for a while without courage to post this. So, it was in 2000. I was uh, 13 in a small farm town in northern British Columbia. I was staying for the summer at my grandparents' farm. Being that they have a small lake on the property, I loved fishing. And I liked this girl down the street. Around one of the last days I was staying there, I had told the girl to come by around 8 p.m. Around dark for dinner. <laughs> yeah, I know it's pretty late for dinner. But I told her that I would be in the front to open the gate. Uh, this gate cannot be locked. I guess it was just there to, well, be there. So, around 7.55, I waited and saw her coming down the street, and I called her. Hey, hurry up, it's getting cold here. She started walking faster, and I heard a sound that would haunt me forever. First, I thought it was just a dog barking, but then, holy shit, the sound of about 20, 30... Well, okay, I'm exaggerating a little bit, and Coyote started yiping their brains out like mad and coming down the street fast and freaked my 13-year-old self the hell out. I screamed, Quick! They're coming! To the girl, but she was shocked. So I ran over there about 40 meters and grabbed her in my arms. And she was small, luckily. And I dashed for the fence opening and continued my sprint to the house, which was about 100 meters. When I got to the house, I dropped her on the floor. And now I didn't realize the pack was on our heels the whole time because, well, the gate doesn't lock. My grandpa slammed the door shut and placed two bookshelves in front. We all hid in my bedroom and we heard the coyotes. Now, to this day, I can only assume they were coyotes. Destroying the door and other stuff in front of my house. And being redneckish, we went on to eat dinner and fix the door the next day, not caring about what happened just the night before. Well, I lost touch with the girl, and now that I think about it, we could have died. So, crazy coyotes, let's not meet again. The Birdman by Bananaface117 so, I've been looking at some of the stories of strange people, and I remembered a strange encounter I had a few years ago. Here's some backstory. My family has been going to a ski resort in Vermont for about five years during Christmas break, and this happened during our third year. So, here it is. On the second day of our vacation, we had a ski instructor who pointed out a man skiing down the mountain who had small black parts falling off of his jacket. Our instructor named him Birdman because he was a crazy guy who made his jacket out of road-killed birds. He apparently lived on the mountain and is known for harassing people on the slopes and in the gondolas. For some unreason, however, the resort isn't allowed to kick him off the slope. So we go through our lesson and we, my 10-year-old little brother, John and I, at the time, I was 13. Notice, this guy is always behind us on the slope. So, after the lesson, our parents want to go home, but John and I want to stay. My parents are always nice to us, and because we know the way back to our condo, they allow us to stay out and ski a bit more. My brother and I ski to the very bottom of the mountain, and we arrive at the longest gondola on the mountain. I begin to smell a rotting stench, and when I turn around, I'm horrified. This Birdman has followed us to the bottom of the mountain and is about to get on the gondola with us. Now, the bottom of the mountain is almost empty, so when we get into the gondola, it's just me, my brother, and this crazy guy. When we start up the mountain, and he takes off his ski mask. He has long, greasy brown hair. He's unshaven and smells horrible. He starts to smile and shows his incredibly crooked teeth and they look like they haven't been brushed in years. He starts to speak and his breath smells like cigarettes and alcohol. He asks us where our parents were and if we want to ski with him. 
I immediately tense up because I know that we were alone with a random, creepy guy and will be about 10 minutes before we get to the mid station. He then looks at my brother, smiles, and tries to grab his ski poles. I instantly put my hand out to block his attempt to grab my brother and he swats my arm away. I look up and see that we are approaching the mid station and I get ready to get off because I know that there is a double chair and we can get away. We get off the gondola quickly and I notice he is getting off too. My brother and I sprint, or at least waddle quickly in winter gear and ski boots into the double chair. We hop on and we see him get on three chairs back. It's a long chair ride and I'm trying to comfort my brother because he is scared and crying. When we reach the top, we race halfway down an easy open trail and hid behind a small access shed. I looked out to see the bird man go flying down the hill looking for us. After waiting about 10 minutes, we ski to the bottom and take a shuttle bus back to our condo. In hindsight, I should have reported this to someone, but I was too scared at the time. We have continued to come here every year since, and no sign of the Birdman. But I am always on the lookout. So listen here, Psycho, who tried to lure my younger brother and I, and who wears dead birds for a jacket. Let's not meet again. Well, there you have it, 10 Let's Not Meet stories from Reddit. The links to these stories will be in the description. I really hope you guys enjoyed this. Uh, be sure to leave comments below, hit that like button, and subscribe. It really does help out. So, monsters, until next time.